Anyway, this morning I want to continue our series on the joy of the Lord with a message that I've entitled The Joy of Christmas. And we're going to close with this song, but uh, as I was looking for material to You know, during the week, I naturally thought of the hymn, Joy to the World, if you're speaking of the joy of Christmas, which I love to sing at Christmas time. It's an amazing song, but as I read the hymn and the closer I looked at it, it became obvious to me that it was a hymn about the second coming, not the incarnation, which is kind of interesting. In fact, Sir Isaac Watts wrote the hymn from Psalms 98, and the ninth verse proclaims, Let the mountains sing together for joy. Before the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth, for He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. And we know from John 3.17 that God sent the Son into the world not to judge the world, but what? To save the world. That That was the point of the incarnation, the cross and the resurrection and the redemption that would be offered to all men because of that. And So he's actually talking about the second coming. In fact, he's describing in both... Psalms 98, and in that great hymn, Joy to the World, the second coming and subsequent millennial reign of Christ. It's a beautiful thing that we have to look forward to. It's awesome to consider what's being said in this hymn because that will be when Christ will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. That will be when the curse on nature will be removed as it talks about in the hymn. That's when the Nations will have to prove the glories of His righteousness. That's when He will rule the world with truth and grace. Now He rules in our hearts with truth and grace, doesn't He? Because that's the the consequence of redemption. That's the consequence of our obedience to come to Christ as Lord and Savior. But that will be when Christ reigns as King of kings and Lord of Lords during the millennium, that will be when the curse is removed and so on and so forth. So it's actually a song about the second coming, but that all said, I still love to sing the song at Christmas because it foretells and it puts the song, the culmination and wonder and joy that will come about because of the first coming. We need the first coming. Even the Jews, when Jesus came, they wanted a political liberator. They wanted to make him king after he served them a great lunch. He knew if anybody, they, they knew if somebody could do that, they could take care of Rome with no problem. But that wasn't their problem. The problem was that we had a sin problem. The problem was all men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All men needed a redeemer. And unless the redeemer came the first time, there would be no second time that we could experience. The Incarnation. You know, you really can't speak of the Incarnation without speaking of the Second Coming. And that's what we're going to see today. Both the Incarnation and the consequence, which is the Second Coming. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. The joy that was brought to our sin-darkened world by the first coming or the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ when God became a man. And we want to talk about the full implications of that. As John 1.14 says, and we, the eternal Word, John 1.1, 1, 1, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And and we want to talk about the full implications of that. And with Him, He brought great joy to the world. That's what I want us to look at this morning. The joy He brought to the world that wasn't just confined to His birth, but has literally caused joy through the ages and will cause joy on into eternity. I want you to think about that. With Him, He brings great joy to the world. So first of all, there was the joy of His birth. Obviously a wonderful time in the history of the world. There was the joy of His birth and all the events that surrounded it. I think of Elizabeth and Zacharias. She who was barren was told she would be with child in her old age. 
And it was so weird to Zacharias that uh, God had to strike him deaf. He said, you're going to name him John. And at the end of that period, when he was born, they said, what's his name? And Zacharias said, John. He wrote it on a piece of paper. (laughs) Because God told him that. And and she was told, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Luke 1.14. Why? Because he was the one who was clearing the way for Israel to accept and embrace their Messiah. Which we know they didn't. At least for the most part. Interestingly, when Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit with Christ, the Christ child, she goes to see Elizabeth. And what happens? Well, when they get near each other, John literally leaps for joy in her womb, it says. That's the kind of joy that this event brought about. It was supernatural. It was beyond our, really beyond our understanding. Then there was the joy of Mary, a virgin betrothed to Joseph who was told she would be supernaturally with child by the Holy Spirit and, and he would be the Son of the Most High God. He would be the Savior of the world. He would reign on the throne of David as we read earlier. In the Magnificent, beginning in Luke one forty six, Mary says, My soul exalts the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. She's pretty excited about it. But you think of all the cross she had to bear, the stigma, that she was thought to be an adulteress. Jesus was thought to be the illegitimate child of Mary, and so on and so forth, till the day of her death. But still she had that joy. I always loved that statement when she would hear things about the... The Christ child, she would hear things about Jesus and it said, Mary would treasure these things in her heart. And I love that. You know, because that's where the joy came, the rejoicing in the Lord. He was her Lord as well as, as all those who would embrace Him by faith. But she would treasure those things in her heart because the stigma attached with what God had asked her to do was so great. Particularly in that society. And there was the joy of the shepherds. Turn to Luke chapter 2. I love the shepherds because the shepherds had nothing to do with this. <laughs> you know, they, were, they were like sitting out there watching the sheep, making sure some bears and lions didn't get a hold of them. And all of a sudden, it says in verse 8, it says, Luke 2, 8, he says, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. They were guarding their flocks. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them. <laughs> you can imagine what this is like. They've got a little fire going, probably. It was probably cold. It was probably around March when the actual birth took place. But, but they're out there, and, and all of a sudden this angel, this glorious angel, stood there. He says, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. You know, I don't, I don't know what it's like to, to be in where the Shekinah glory of God is shining around you. But it must be an awesome experience. Moses came down from the mountain glowing. I don't know if the shepherds started glowing, but it was, must have been an amazing thing. And they were terribly frightened. Not just frightened, they were shaking in their boots. Or in their sandals, whatever they were in. And he says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of what? Great joy not just joy but great joy which will be for all the people think of the joy that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation as the gospel has been shared with people think of the joy just unbounded joy that has been ours and we'll talk about that later because of this announcement and because of this birth he says for today in the city of david there has been Born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, I don't know what a multitude is, but it's a lot. (laughs) You know, just the whole sky just lights up with a chorus of angels. And here's these shepherds. I mean, they, they, they weren't expecting this. They didn't even know what was going on. 
And all of a sudden, there's this gigantic choir of angels singing, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom He is pleased. Then it says, When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing and what has happened which the Lord has made known to us. Yeah, I guess. I mean, almost like watching a nuclear explosion, then going and wondering if you ought to tell somebody it happened. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. Then it says in verse 18, And all who heard it wondered at the things which are told them by the shepherds. These men just didn't invent this. They weren't just given to lying and making up stories. They were totally taken aback by everything that went on. They were not expecting it. And this happens, and they're told where to go, and then they shared what happened. And you can just imagine the joy in the stable. I would imagine it was just overwhelming. And, you know, again, Mary starts treasuring those things in her heart about the things that are being said about this child. You see, the joy surrounding our Lord's birth was comprehensive. The joy of the sacred event not only rattled the portals of heaven, I would imagine the joy of the Father and and heaven was just uh, resounding, but it broke out in the skies over Bethlehem as a multitude of angels burst forth and praised to God, announcing glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men of good will. In other words, the Savior had come. Finally, after centuries of waiting for the, the heralded Savior, He came, the deliverer from sin was now in a, hu- a fleshly human body, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world and, and all who would believe in Him would come to eternal life, John one twenty nine, and all of heaven rejoices. And all who knew rejoiced here on earth. You know, I can just imagine that at Jesus' baptism... The Father proclaims, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. I can just imagine what He was saying at the birth. You know, this is my beloved Son who will redeem mankind and and He will be our peace. He's the Prince of Peace. He will bring men back to peace with Me. He'll make peace by the blood of His cross. Savior had come. The coming of Christ was cause for literally for ultimate joy because it brought glory to God and peace with God to men. You know, Romans 5.1 says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. No incarnation, no peace with God. God would just once again pour out His wrath on the earth as He did with the flood, but Christ took on the wrath of God for us. Now, there was good reason for all this because secondly... The one who came would live his life with one goal and one purpose in mind. The cross and the resurrection. He was born for that purpose. That's why he came into the world. He, just, he didn't just come into the world to do miracles, to feed the, the masses. He didn't come to be king. He didn't come to reign. He came for the purpose of dying on the cross, but rising from the dead victorious over sin and death. You know, somebody, I heard somebody comparing that this week to people playing a football game without a ball. Can you imagine the Super Bowl? All 22 of those guys get out there and they're just pounding on each other. And, and it's like a big gladiatorial fight, right? And pointless. Because there's no reason for it without a ball. Right? If you're not moving the ball up and down the field and going for the goal for the score, there's no point to it. Same thing with the cross. Many people have died on crosses. Many people have been brutally murdered. That's just the way this world is because Satan is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. But, when Christ died on the cross, His stated purpose was that I am going to take on the justice and wrath of God Almighty for man's sin, and He did. And three days later, He rises from the dead. He played the game with a ball. And the ball was the resurrection. Same thing with life. You know, life without Christ is like a game without a ball. You don't have Christ, you've got nothing. 
You know, I don't care what you think you have, you haven't got it. Until you add Christ in, you have no point to the game. So when you add the cross and the resurrection, you add the Lord Jesus Christ who is the Savior of the world to the game, then it has a point. It has a purpose. And that purpose began to unfold the day man sinned and fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. The Messiah who would be born of the Virgin, Isaiah 7.14, the seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, would bruise the serpent's head and he would destroy the works of the devil. You know, 1 John 3.8 says, Jesus came for that purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And what were the works of the devil? Well, sin. And the consequences of sin, the wages of sin is death. So at the cross, sin was destroyed because Christ took on the wrath of God for sinners. Shed His blood, He gave His life for us. Then three days later, He rose victorious over sin and death. He not only destroyed the cause, He destroyed the consequence at the cross. And Satan was defeated, who is the prince of this world. He would... Render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, it says in Hebrews 2.14, for the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, and all from Adam to present have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 tells us, there's none righteous, not one, but with the coming of Jesus, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Again, Romans 6.23. That's why he came. He brought the ball (laughs) into the game. I love John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And when did He give Him? At the Incarnation. Son will be born to us. That whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is, again, the goal of why we believe in Jesus. We will live forever most comforting thought in the world in a dying world this world is all about dying (laughs) you know the minute you're born you're on your way out you know we just saw that this morning as sandy was standing there one second and next second her leg is broken i mean that's the way this world is it's it's moment by moment and and terrible things happen and they will happen probably to most of us you know, and nobody escapes this world without the specter of death hanging over their head. But Christ destroyed both the cause and the consequence at the cross. And we will have eternal life. The one had finally come, and he was alive on earth. And no man ever lived or spoke like this one. Because this was the holy and righteous one of God in human flesh, Acts 3.14 tells us. Listen to what Isaiah, let's read that whole passage in Isaiah chapter 9 that Pastor Ray read this morning. I want you to really contemplate this. Isaiah 9 is amazing because it's such a comprehensive prophecy. It's not just talking about the first coming, it's talking about what would happened because of the first coming. He says, look in verse 1, he says, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in earlier times. He treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. And there you have salvation to the Gentiles as well as to the Jew. To the Jew first, because Jesus came through the nation of Israel, through the lineage of Israel, through the line of David and Abraham. And, and, but it was also for the Gentiles, it's for all the people, right? And the people who walk in darkness, speaking of both Jew and Gentile, will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And you shall multiply the nation, and you shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence with the gladness of a harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. That's what salvation does, isn't it? It brings joy, it brings gladness, it brings, you know, life without joy, what is it? 
depression. <laughs> so, you know, we as Christians have great joy, don't we? And then he says, and he tells us why, and he says, for you shall break the yoke of their burden. And what is our burden? Sin. And the consequences of sin. Sin and death and the staff on their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor. Who's that? Well, I believe it's Satan. The prince of this world, the god of this age who blinds minds, man's minds that they might not see the glory of the gospel of Christ. And, and then he says in verse 6, he says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given And then in that little blank space is the time between the first and second comings. Because it says the government will rest on his shoulders. Did the government rest on Christ's shoulders the first time he came? No. Then he says it again, in case you missed it the first time. He says, and his name, this child who was born to us, will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, You could sum those all up in the word Emmanuel, which means God with us. Then it says there will be no end to the increase of his government or peace. Again, in that little white space between those, those verses is the first and the second comings. One is, this is who the child will be. The next is, and the government... There will be no end to the increase of his government or a peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Again, the first and second coming are inextricably linked, aren't they? You can't have one without the other. And if you had the first one, you've got to have the second one. And that's what he's talking about here. He's just saying this child will be amazing, but his purpose was to come and die for the sin of man, to bring us into the kingdom of God. And then he will come and reign in glory one day. You see, the one who was Israel's Messiah, the light of the Gentiles and to the world, was here. Not to reign and judge, but to save those who, because of sin, were condemned, you and me. He was the wonderful, and the Hebrew means the incomprehensible one. He was the divine counselor, full of grace and truth, the mighty God, the omnipotent one, the omnipotent God, the eternal Father, the, the one who is one with the Father, John 10.30, I and the Father are one. He was the eternal Father in a human body. Because remember, we worship one true God. We don't worship three. We worship the one true God manifest in three persons. And He was the Prince of Peace who came to offer salvation to a sinful, condemned world in a human body. That was this baby born in Bethlehem. That's why the shepherds were given a heavenly chorus by a multitude. That's why they went and shared these things with Joseph and Mary. And that's why that stable was probably bonkers that first night. Must have been the most glorious, joyous place on the face of the earth ever. Because the Messiah had come. He was perfect man and he was perfect God. The theologians call that the hypostatic union. He came and he lived as no other man has ever lived, but the real significance of his life is seen in the joy of the purpose for which he lived his life. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. By the time we're done, you'll get a little bit of a workout here with your Bible. But in Hebrews chapter 12, we get a summation of our Lord's life. He says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and he's talking about the heroes of the faith in chapter 11. And that could be us. That's, he says, because he says, let us also... Let us also live like they lived, by faith. And how do you do that? Well, you lay aside every encumbrance. We were, we were just talking about that earlier this morning, Brett and I. You know, what is it that holds you back that may be a good thing? You know, it could be a good thing in your life, but it's keeping you from really living your life for the Lord. He says, and the sin which so easily entangles us, 
Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There is so much in those two verses, it would take weeks probably to unpack them properly. But in verse 2, we have a summation of our Lord's life. He came and He lived as no other man ever lived, as the author and perfecter of faith. He was the perfect example of that. He was the perfect sinless Lamb of God, the one who saves, sanctifies, and sustains us. And it's in that sinless perfection that He went to the cross for that was His divine purpose of why He came. The birth is pointless without the cross. And the cross is pointless without the resurrection. A lot of people have been born. (laughs) Nobody's been born of a virgin before, but nobody was willing to accept that either. But then He went to the cross and a lot of people have died Miserable deaths like that, but nobody has risen from the dead never to die again. There have been people who have come back, you know, thanatology and all that stuff, and but they always die again. Lazarus came back, the Lord raised him, Lazarus come forth, and the kind of power that could have been demonstrated there if he just said come forth, every tomb in the world would have emptied. But it was Lazarus come forth, but Lazarus Died again, didn't he? Christ rose to ascend to the right hand of the Father, didn't he? Never to deal with death again. At least in himself. He's the one who saves, sanctifies, and sustains us. And he did it with joy, it says. (laughs) He despised the shame for... Curses is he who hangs on, the tr- on a tree, the Old Testament tells us. And he endured the cross to get to the joy that was set before him. You say, what was that joy? Well, let's think this through. First of all, the resurrection. Jesus rose victorious three days after the cross, triumphant over sin and death. And salvation was now a free gift offered to all men. Joy to the world. The works of the devil were now destroyed. Potentially for every man, woman, and child that has ever lived. All they needed to do was put their faith now in the crucified, risen Lord. Secondly, there was the joy of exaltation. He sat down at the right hand of the Father on high. That's the place of prominence, the place of power, the Father's purpose being fulfilled. Men could now be reconciled to the Father by the substitutionary atoning work of the Son. It was finished. He said on the cross, Te telestai, it's finished. The transaction is complete. My, your sin was imputed to Christ. He bore it. He bore the Father's wrath. Your, his righteousness was imputed to you if you would just accept Him as your Lord and Savior. There's great joy in that transaction. Jesus was now exalted and was given a name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee would bow of those who are in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's exaltation. To be given the name that's above every name, and that because He's God. This was God dying, giving His life for us. And in heaven, they're singing a new song. It says, Worthy are you to take the book. And remember in Revelation chapter 5 what that book is? It's a title deed to the earth. And to break its seals, it said, because as Jesus begins to break those seals, the mighty, powerful judgments of God unfold. And in that seventh seal is is included the seven trumpet judgments and the seven bowl judgments, final judgments of God's wrath. And He is worthy. And it says, it tells us why He is worthy. It says, For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You know, we not only accept Jesus, we have been purchased by Jesus, it says from before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1. He purchased you by divine sovereign act 
as he died and rose again and conquered sin and death on your behalf. It's a powerful, powerful thought. So there was the joy of exaltation, which will go on forever. You know, heaven will resound forever with the glory of the Lamb and what he did. And we'll be the ones singing his praises. And it will just be full of grace and mercy and just be an amazing time. Then there was the joy of redemption. That continues to this day and will continue until the end of the millennium and the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20 and then forever in the new heavens and new earth as we proclaim the glory of Christ's redemption in our lives. We will be awestruck by it in that time. All of heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. And since the cross and the resurrection, there have been multiple millions. So for the joy set before Him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and He sits at the right hand of the Father forever rejoicing, forever exalted. You know, I, I, when you even just describe the cross physically, you just don't even understand how anybody could take that kind of beating, do what happened, and... You know, and then get up there and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. That's, it, it's just beyond our way of thinking. There's one more aspect to the joy of surrounding, the joy surrounding the cross and the resurrection, and that's the joy that is ours. The joy that belongs to all of those who know and love the Lord Jesus. I want you to turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 16, and verse 16. You know, we're not in the same position as the disciples. We wouldn't actually see the risen Lord. We can just see His marvelous, incredible work in our lives and how He's transformed us, and so on and so forth, then we know He's alive. But listen to this. Jesus is foretelling His death and resurrection to His disciples. and He says, a little while and you will no longer see Me. And again, a little while and you will see Me. (laughs) That would be confusing if you knew nothing about resurrection, right? Right? He says, some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he is telling us? Like, what's up? You know, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father, because he kept telling him, because I go to the Father, I'm going to send the Spirit, and so on and so forth. They're putting all this together, and they're thinking, wow, what is going on here? So they were saying, what is this that he says a little while, and we do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, Are you deliberating together about this, that I said a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. I would imagine that the cross, Satan and his demons, and those who hated the Christ were just howling with joy, their own perverted kind of joy. The world was rejoicing. God had been put out. Just as they rejoice today that God is being put out of our 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 lives by let's see, Darwin. Anyway. But they were just howling. You will grieve, but your joy will be turned to joy. Your grief will be turned to joy. Say, how so? Well, he says, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, when she sees the child, up until that time, the woman has never seen the child. In those days, they didn't have sonograms and that kind of thing. Thanks, Jim. But when they actually visibly saw the child, all the pain went away. It was like, wow, here's this kid, and I'm excited, whether it was to be a boy or a girl or... I see John and Whitney there, you know, holding their newborn. And, you know, the joy of childbirth is gone. And it was painful, I would imagine. They say there's nothing on it like earth. And I'm glad I'm not a woman. 
But when she sees the child, it says she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. I think all of you women and men can uh, identify with that. He says, therefore, you too have grief now. Remember the shepherd was taken, the sheep were scattered, the and all the denials and so on and so forth and the running and he says, but I will see you again. The analogy there is he would in physical form see them again. And your heart will rejoice, and then I love this, and no one will take your joy away from you. If you know the risen, resurrected Christ, there is nothing in this world that can rob you of your joy. You know, if you're just playing church and you're just playing Christianity and you're just paying lip service, then you can get your joy robbed that quick. If you have seen the risen Lord in the Word of God, you know, like it says in 1 Peter, you know, you haven't seen Him, but you love Him, and you don't see Him now, but you believe in Him. And he says, and he says knowing, you greatly rejoice knowing as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. There's nothing in this world that can take away our joy if we really understand the resurrection. So I think these verses are self-explanatory. Just as a woman soon gets over her labor for the joy of bringing a child into the world, the disciples would soon get over the brutality of the cross for the utter joy of seeing their risen Lord. Grief would be turned to joy, a joy that could never, never be taken away. And I, I just love that. You know, these guys went out and they died, and they died some horrific kind of deaths. Peter, they say, was crucified upside down even after he watched his wife being crucified and didn't deny the Lord. In fact, he didn't even think himself worthy to be crucified the same as Christ because he saw the resurrected Lord. That was the point. There was victory over sin and death in this sinful, dying world. And that was the whole point. You know, I love Luke 24 where it says they still could not believe it because of the joy and amazement of seeing the risen Lord. They were just awestruck. So we see the joy of the cross and the resurrection, the purpose for which our, our Lord was born into this world, and great has been His joy and the joy of heaven ever since. And we also see the joy of the believer who worships the risen Lord, the one who conquered sin and death on his behalf to offer each undeserving saint the free gift of eternal life. Consummate joy, or you could say joy eternal, life everlasting. I mean, what would a man exchange for this world? The only thing I'd give up this world for is forgiveness and eternal life. Otherwise, this is all you have to cling to. This is it. Grab all the gusto, man. Because you're only going around once, and then it's going to be a long eternity in a place you wouldn't even want to consider being. Have you seen the resurrected Lord? Do you see the resurrected Lord and that baby who was born in the stable? And we see, do we see the joy of the believer who worships the risen Lord? Now, one last thing, and it's hard to talk about the first coming without mentioning briefly and finally the joy of the second coming. Because remember, even when we take communion, our Lord said, do this in remembrance of me, and remember that I'll drink this anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So he's not just talking about, don't just remember a person dying. Remember a person who rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death, who ascended, after 40 days, to the right hand of the Father, who is preparing even now to come again. And He will gather you to Himself, however that may be, and you will drink this cup anew with Him in the kingdom. Why isn't the bread there? Well, the bread's not there because He is the bread of life. Right? That's who He is. We'll be in His presence forever. So, we'll just drink to the fact that He gave His life, He shed His blood for our sins. Turn to Revelation 19 and we'll close here.
I love this passage. I hope I can read it without crying. <laughs> Revelation 19 is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible because it it talks about the end of the world and the beginning of the new world. He says, after these things, and he's talking about Mystery Babylon, which was destroyed, and the great harlot that was destroyed, the harlot religious system. And he, he says, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude. Not just a multitude, but a great multitude. Millions and millions and millions of redeemed of all time. Old Testament, New Testament saints, tribulation saints, so on and so forth, are just all gathered And they're singing, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Because His judgments are true and righteous. He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality. And all false religion is immoral. It's evil. Because it corrupts men. It sends them on the wrong path. It's the broad highway that leads to destruction. And he says, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Isn't it amazing how false religion always wants to kill Christians? Have you ever noticed that down through history? They always want to kill true believers. I don't know why we're so irritating, but that's just the way it is, right? In a second time, they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you His bondservants, you who fear Him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder. You can just imagine this multitude. And we're going to be part of it. Saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. He has finally taken His awesome power and He has begun to reign. And it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to Him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. Right before Christ returns to earth, there is the consummation of the marriage with the bride. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then it says in verse 11, I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. It doesn't say it was like a white horse or smelled like a horse. It was a white horse. The guys in Ukraine don't agree with me, but. And behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. The second coming has nothing to do with salvation has everything to do with judgment and finality. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns or diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is the eternal God. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, speaking metaphorically of his sacrifice for our sin. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, Notice what the church was given. Clothed in fine linen, verse 8, bright and clean. We're following him on white horses. You know, you can argue all you want about the white horses, but you know, when it says Christ comes with great power and glory on the clouds of heaven, seeing millions, billions of an army surrounded by angels, lit by the Shekinah glory of God, I don't know why people argue about white horses. <laughs> it's a pet peeve. Anyway, you know the joy and ecstasy of these two events, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the coming back with Him at the second coming to reign with Him will be electrifying. Not just joyful, but it will be so ecstatic there will be nothing in eternity that you'll be able to compare it to. Nothing. Be the most awesome event that we'll ever partake in. Words can barely describe, even begin to scratch the surface of the fulfillment of these words, what it will be like. 
you know, the praise and the honor and glory for our Lord taking His unequaled power and judging the Antichrist and His forces and the great harlot religious system will be celebratory and electrifying because finally sin and dying will come to an end. Thank God. You know, I, I love Revelation 11, and I'll just read this to you real quick, but he... This is when the seventh trumpet is about to sound, and out of the seventh trumpet comes the last final bowls of God's wrath where he reclaims the earth. And and the seventh angel sounded, and it says in, in verse 15 of chapter 11, he says, And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God. Who Who rules this world right now? Satan. You know, Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, he's the God of this age. Jesus even called him the prince of this world in John 14.30, and he has nothing to do with Christ, he said. But anyway, Jesus takes his great power and he begins to reign forever and ever. Not just in men's hearts, but to reign, period. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And right before the bowls are poured out, listen to what's going on in the temple of God. The temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in His temple, and there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. The creation just goes nuts at the announcement of Christ ruling again. You see, the celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb as the saints of all time are gathered from east and west and north and south to sit at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this celebration will be wondrous and monumental as the church age comes to a consummation. We will experience nothing like that ever. It will be amazing when our God takes up His mighty power and begins to reign. The second coming will be the most awesome display of God's power we will ever participate in. As millions upon millions of saints and angels plummet out of heaven on white horses, following Him who sits on the white horse to regain the fallen kingdom of earth from the evil usurper Satan. And then to reign with Him for a thousand years and then to reign with Him forever in the new heavens and new earth. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? (laughs) That's what the Word of God says. The Word of God. Not this isn't written by man. Man couldn't even come up with these things, these thoughts. This is the Word of God. And the question is, do we believe it or don't we? You know, I wanted to coin a word, it was called joy electrifying will be the measure of those events. There will be just so much joy. You will be so ecstatic with, with joy and praise and honor to glory and glory towards God and towards the Lamb that it, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. So, my prayer, beloved, is that you and I find great joy in our Lord Jesus who once again we celebrate this Christmas season. So Merry Christmas. And I wanted to give you the whole story because like I said, the cross, the birth without the cross, again, is like a game without a ball. And the cross without the resurrection is like a game without a ball. The first coming without the second coming is like a game without a ball. There's no point to it. So what do we have to look forward to? Well, the Word of God says we have so much to look forward to 
you, you should walk out of this place about five inches off the ground. Amen. You should probably go out and try and see if you could walk on water. <laughs> we'll let Jim try that. But you know, if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, we would love to share that joy with you. And we would love to introduce you to the one who is not only the baby of Christmas, but the risen Savior of eternity. The one who's coming back again and will make all things right in this world. Let's pray.